Welcome to The Business, I'm Elise Morgan. Coming up on the program, the calm before the employment storm. National job losses mount as Victoria battles the latest wave of infections. And the city professional working in the country. Why the regions are pandemic winners as more unskilled jobs are lost overseas. Business confidence has turned sharply negative again around the country amid Victoria's strong wave of virus infections. And jobs and wages also continue to fall. The evidence is stacking up. Victoria is sending shockwaves across the economy. Bureau of Statistics data shows since mid-March to the end of July, the number of payroll jobs across Australia declined 4.5 per cent. On Victoria, the decline has been much sharper at 6.7. Nationally, wages have fallen almost 5 per cent. Fits in with the NAB's closely watched business survey, which shows business confidence dropped from zero to minus 14 in July, while conditions continue to improve for now. Businesses in South Australia, WA, Queensland and Tassie fared better, but there's concerns Victoria will drag them all down. NAB's chief economist Alan Oster joined me from Melbourne. Alan Oster, confidence was down sharply in the month, off by 14 points, and this was before uh, the latest Victorian lockdown. What drove it? So I think people were a little bit spooked. Um, it didn't look like Victoria was much worse in terms of the uh, confidence effect than, say, New South Wales. Uh, and as you know, the actual outcomes in terms of business conditions improved. So it was sort of was saying that the economy's was doing better than people thought, but they were scared. And I think you're going to see both outcomes and confidence go down further over the next couple of months. Yeah, on, on conditions, um, they continue to pick up over the month and they're now flat. Uh, do you expect uh, those to decline significantly over August? I would expect that they would. We're expecting that the lockdown in terms of GDP for Victoria will probably take 15% off GDP in the, in the uh, September quarter. So it's a massive hit to Victoria and they're 20% of the Australian economy. Of course, that's a big deal for you know, the national accounts, but does it necessarily weigh on the confidence of a business that's, say, in Perth or, or Brisbane? Short answer is no. Um, however, uh, in maybe New South Wales, you get more nervous that you know, maybe things will get away from them. There will also be supply chain issues. I mean, Melbourne still is the biggest uh, container port in Australia. And so how bad do you expect uh, the survey for August to be? I mean, back in May, we saw confidence at levels of minus 21, business conditions minus 24, employment was down by 31. Um, how bad do you expect it to be with the new lockdown uh, and the ramped up border closures that we've got as well? Well, I would have thought that for the Victorian numbers, they'll be similar to what we're just talking about. Hopefully for other parts of Australia, like New South Wales, it's at minus six. I don't think it necessarily, in terms of business conditions, is going to, is going to get worse. I hope it's not. So you're going to get a very different effect across uh, parts of Australia. And Western Australia um, is, seems to be doing pretty well. And so does Queensland. So, you know, you wouldn't expect that it would fall off the cliff there, but obviously it's going to fall off the cliff in Victoria. And what about employment intentions? Are you seeing a significant difference between the states? I mean, obviously Victoria is going to be absolutely smashed. That's, that's right. And you saw it today also in the statisticians' payroll data, where essentially Australia, outside of Victoria, went sideways. Victoria went down over the last month about 4% in employment. So... Again, this is a very specific Victorian issue. Um, the real issue becomes if it sort of flows into New South Wales, then you're talking half the economy or more than half the economy. At present, you know, it can be awful for Victoria, for hopefully for six weeks and then that's it. But, you know, it's still going to be a problem in the sense we'll go hopefully from stage four to stage three. Uh, we're not going to go straight from stage four to stage two, which is where everybody else is. Now, the government and Treasury, a couple of weeks before the latest lockdown, estimated that around 120,000 people would lose their jobs between now and Christmas. What do you think that number is now? We're talking... Well, we think by early next year, unemployment's probably going to be very close to 10. I think our numbers tomorrow will be 9, 7. So you're talking 
you know, a couple of hundred thousand people. Um, whatever you thought two to three weeks ago, you've got to basically make it much worse. And I think the Reserve Bank's talking about 10% uh, in, by the end of this year. We think the, the peak will probably be a, a little bit later. Um, and the real problem is you're still talking about unemployment, you know, close to 8% by this time next year or by the end of next year. So it's going to stay for a long time. And businesses will now be preparing for the changes to the job keeper program. How do you expect that to affect business confidence and and also uh, layoffs? Yeah, so we we continue to expect to see unemployment continue to go up from now essentially to early next year. Um, you're going to get less money into the consumer's hands through job keeper and job seeker, and so therefore people have less money. They're still worried about their jobs. Some of them are going to lose jobs. I'm sure there's some firms in Victoria that are saying, oh, we've just closed temporarily, but they'll never reopen. And that just says, I don't suspect to see much growth in the next six months, essentially. Is it time for the government to consider keeping the job keeper and seeker levels at, at the higher levels until at least March? Well, I think they're going to have to sit back and watch and see what the economy is. I suspect ultimately they probably are going to have to spend more money. Given that they've just made a decision a couple of weeks ago, I think they will wait to see how the data goes because we're all sort of guessing depending on what happens to the virus. Alan Oster, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Elise. Reporting season under the shadow of coronavirus continues and it comes as no surprise that Sydney Airport feeling the pain today. The airport reported a loss of nearly $52 million for the first half of the year. The number of passengers was down 57% over the six months. For the second quarter, it became a drop of 97%. Sydney Airport seeking to raise $2 billion to bolster its cash reserves. No surprises, no dividend. Annuities firm Challenger swung to a big full-year loss of almost half a billion dollars, down from last year's $300 million profit. Funds under management increased over the period, but its investment performance really dragged. The dividend's been scrapped. And retail landlords continue to feel the pinch. SCA Property saw a 22% drop in full-year profit to $85 million as the value of its properties declined. The company says it provided rent relief to more than 600 tenants, which reduced its rent collection for the period to 77%. It will pay a dividend, though, of just $0.05. Cents. None of this concerned investors on the ASX today. It closed half a percent higher at 6,138. I spoke with Steve Johnson from Forager. Sydney Airport obviously had a pretty horrible result after seeing just, you know, 3% of its normal traffic over the last quarter. Um, but they're looking to the market for about $2 billion in fresh funds. Uh, are people going to go for it? Uh, yes, they've got it fully underwritten, so people will put the money in and I think retail investors have time here to wait and see where the shares trade in the interim. Look, this is a, a great business that will at some point come back, but I think the message from today is the lenders to these infrastructure assets that thought they were extremely safe don't want as much debt in these businesses as they, they were comfortable with a year ago. And that's going to mean shareholders coughing up with more of their own money. And I think it dilutes the returns you can expect over the long term here. So this is not the last that we'll, we'll see of these. Uh, and I think it's a negative for shareholders for sure. Uh, and uh, it was out yesterday, but Adairs is yet another sort of homeware store that has played an absolute blinder over the last couple of months as people have been locked in their homes and thought they might do a bit of an upgrade. Now, you're a holder of, uh, of Adairs. Um, it's a company that's also had, had the benefit of JobKeeper but also announced a dividend. How do you feel about that? Yeah, it's controversial, but I'm quite comfortable with it. The full year dividend for Adairs is uh, less than it was last year. They actually cancelled their interim dividend when they didn't know what was going on. And every single store that this company has was closed through March and April. And if JobKeeper hadn't, exist, they hadn't existed, they would have had to lay off a lot of staff. So I think the fact that the business is now going well is a credit to the company. It's a credit to the government program as well that it's enabled them to keep all of those people on. Steve Johnson, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Liz.
The nation's enforced period of working from home could have a silver lining for regional areas, bringing jobs and workers previously tethered to city offices. Skilled workers are being kept on shore in places like Mornington and Noosa. How nice. But the pandemic is seeing many jobs pushed offshore, with wages a lot less expensive in Manila or Mumbai. Daniel Ziffer reports. Visit a city financial planner and the grunt work of drafting documents and agreements might be done here. It's possible with technology the way it is, you don't need to be in a big city, particularly if you want to have a professional job. How Rachel Bragg works is called BPO, Business Process Outsourcing. So now people are looking to outsource that work because it's just easier. It's somebody that you give discrete pieces of work to, to complete them on your behalf. It's long established for frontline tasks like call centres and help desks to be contracted out. Now, increasingly difficult tasks are being outsourced. I don't need to have a full-time payroll person and a full-time marketing person in my order to deliver the outcomes that my organisation needs to deliver. This is Rosebud. It's beautiful, but it's beyond the train network and it's a brutal 75 kilometre commute to Melbourne city centre. The work from home revolution has transformed the lives of people who live here. But is it an opportunity or a threat? Shutting offices and sending workers home during the pandemic may have opened the eyes of some bosses that they don't need as many staff as before. I think that that's clearly a risk. Dr Brendan Rin says the design of the JobKeeper wage subsidy, cementing the link between employers and employees, showed the government's concern about businesses using technology to shed workers. What you're going to see is businesses realise that they're in fact able to produce either a similar amount of output or something close to it with much fewer workers. Probe Group employs 6,000 people in Australia and more in the Asian region. You've probably never heard of them, and that's how they like it. In actual fact, if you speak to our people and say, who do you work for, uh, they typically say the client that they're representing. Mr Hume says the bulk of work sent offshore is less complex and more likely to be automated in the near future. Locals are being engaged on difficult, sensitive and higher value jobs very specialised tasks like web app development, SEO, SEM support, content moderation, mortgage origination, so very precise and complex uh, knowledge tasks. And it's not all one way. The internet and apps now take care of routine inquiries, like checking bank balances and booking appointments. With mainly complex queries left and concerns about data security and privacy, companies are now reshoring jobs. Westpac just brought 1,000 call centre jobs back from India and the Philippines. The ability to lower those barriers and those obstacles, is, it's not a question of, you know, should we, it's why shouldn't we? Go-between Charles Ferguson acts as an employer for companies that want to hire around the globe and sees a bright future for regional Australians. It does create a, let's say, a more even field with respect to talent competition on the global stage. High unemployment looks set to drag on people's lives and the economy for years. Technology and the drive to business process outsourcing opens up regional and global competition to previously protected and high paid jobs. Discreet, piecemeal work may benefit some people, but it's a precarious way to base employment. This pandemic has forced their hand in creating some of that flexibility and, and that might start to tip them over the edge to realising that there is another way. The edge is a tough place to live. And that's all from the business. For more stories, head to our website and click on the business page. I'm Elise Morgan. Good night.